Today I have escaped the confines of my farm and I'm instead beaming in from a much classier location. This is an abandoned railway next to the M1, which you can probably hear. So following on from the agricultural revolution when farmers were invented, and the last episode when farmers stopped being important, by the 1870s British farmers found they weren't able to compete with cheap food imports from abroad. And this happened when it did, because of steamships and steam trains. Most of Britain's meat is carried to her across the seas. In scores of ports, along hundreds of dock sides, the daily stocking of the nation's larder goes on. Beef from the Argentine, beef from Australia, lamb from New Zealand. The new world is called in to satisfy the hunger of the old. And this importation of food allowed the British population to grow much larger than what its soil could organically support, which becomes very important in the Second World War. But this film I'm showing you is particularly depressing because it's championing the British innovations in agriculture that developed new breeds and new technologies that were then exported to countries with cheaper labour, who then undercut the British farmer. These vast new countries are ideally suited to produce meat. Yet once upon a time they lacked the herds. In some of them there were no native cattle. In others, the cattle was unsuitable, small, thin and undeveloped. So the old world was called in to build up the herds of the new. Here, for instance, are Ayrshire cattle. This is one of the breeds especially developed for heavy milk production. You will find these cows all over the world nowadays. So in a nutshell, this is the most important effect of trains in the British countryside. They allow the British farmer to be undercut by his own technology, and this causes a savage economic depression. But as British food became divorced from its land, and the country became more and more urban, transport started shaping food culture. Fish and chips were a reasonable way of feeding working people, and they became more prominent from the 1840s when crates of fish would be put in open wagons, often attached to the back of passenger trains as they made their way to the city. The fishermen get their pay, a share of the value of the catch, which is now on its way to the towns by road and by rail. By the 20th century, special vans were built especially for express fish trains. This channel is about earth-type people rather than water-type people, but I imagine that this was a good time to be a fisherman. And this new, cheap, urban food was important enough that specialist locomotives were built to pull the fish trains. It's a whole thing. But then the railway companies realised that they could do something else with these express routes to the seaside. Tourism. Tourism had always existed for rich people, but with trains, the descendants of the dispossessed peasants who were pushed into the cities could escape again. They could have a cheap day trip to Brighton and get away from the smoke of the factories with an ice cream. But with this, the countryside becomes something new. It becomes an amenity for townspeople. The countryside is somewhere you can go for day trips, somewhere to take the kids on a bank holiday weekend. But as the urban population continues to grow and the rural population continues to shrink, this role as an amenity comes to outweigh its traditional role as a place where rural communities live and work. So the railway companies construct an urban vision of the countryside. This is not about rural culture or selling a rural way of life. By this time there's a massive cultural divide between town and country and a mutual disdain. Townspeople have their own idea of what the countryside should be. They want the beauty and the serenity and the peace and the clean air, but alongside the convenience and all the other good stuff that you get in cities. But now, thanks to trains, they could have that. They could commute and work in the city, take their city wages and then retreat in the evenings or at the weekends into the country. This caused the growth of suburbs as houses sprang up around railway stations, eating up the very countryside that made them attractive. But townspeople could also move into villages and buy up houses as the rural economy faltered. So the railways see the creation of the dormitory village, which is the beginning of the unquestionable cultural supremacy of the urbanite over the countrymen, as the urbanite even controls the villages. But railways did have other effects on farming. Villages now found themselves connected to a countrywide transport network, and farmers could get their produce into market much more efficiently. This completely destroys the traditional droving trade, where animals were walked from the country's rural provinces to its population centres, as these rural railway stations had goods yards with cattle docks, so cattle could be loaded into wagons and delivered to market by train. Grazing animals is less risky than growing crops for sale, as you don't have the cost of ploughing and harvesting, so during the agricultural depression a lot of areas reverted to cattle and sheep production, and made good use of their local rail yards. But even by modern standards, these rail facilities were really cool. 
I recommend you watch a film called A Farmer Moves South, in which a guy moves farm by train, and they put everything that he has, all of his machines, all of his animals, on a train and ship it across the country. It's incredible, I don't think you could do that now. High-speed rail connections also meant you could now get fresh stuff into cities, which previously hadn't really been possible. Cities might have some chickens or pigs kept within them, but keeping a cow in a city for milk is very difficult because they need to eat a lot of grass. And getting milk into a city is very difficult because it spoils easily. But with railways, people could stop relying on butter and cheese for their dairy intake because fresh milk could be shipped straight into the city on express trains. This is what my village did. It used to have lots of very small dairy farms who would all send milk collectively to London by train, which meant getting up very early in the morning. They must have milked very early in the morning, I presume. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did get a good start. Now, in the summer, when the cows were out and you'd got to go down the road to fetch the cows in before you could start, and then you got to milk and cool and load the churns onto the cart as a float and take them to the station half a mile away to catch the train about 8 o'clock, you see. You had to get up in the morning. And indeed, some railways were built almost solely to move milk, such as the Leek and Manifold Railway, which although now dismantled, continues to serve its second purpose as a tourist route in the form of a bike trail. Before we talk about the current state of railways in the countryside, I wanted to show you these old toys, which I think represent the same thing as real railways, in that some things from the past were very cool and we can learn from them. These are toys that have outlived the children who played with them, and being clockwork there's no external power being used other than the kids own energy, which seems quite weird in this digital age. My grandfather had an electric train, which meant he was a very lucky boy. It predates plug sockets, so it was powered through a light fitting and he was only allowed to play with it on Sunday afternoons. But he also had a clockwork one that he could play with whenever he wanted, so it's battered. I really like the things that these toys represent. They're very well made, but also I think inherently peaceful, teaching kids to be the benevolent gods of an imaginary world and to provide it with an efficient transport system. But famously, the British railway system has declined, and from the 1960s, the government closed over half of the stations, including the one that used to serve my village. And growing up in a village that had nothing in it, it would have been very cool to have a railway station, because that would have given me the freedom to travel before I could drive. And indeed, almost every journey I've ever had to make in my entire life could have been done by train. I used to go to school two towns over, which could have been done by train. And this would have greatly reduced my personal carbon footprint. And the line that I would have used was the old Great Central Railway. When the closure of this railway was proposed in the 1960s, it was very controversial because it's a really well-built line. Indeed, before HS2, which is still being built, and HS1, which really is just a link to the Channel Tunnel, the Great Central is the most modern railway that we have in Britain, and it doesn't exist anymore. The railway was built by private enterprise and was intended to connect Liverpool and Manchester to London and Paris via a tunnel. At the time, this was a bit of a risky idea because there were already several other main lines running between London and the north, and the Great Central ran out of money before it reached Paris, instead terminating at London Marylebone. But it was built to a much higher standard than other lines, so it could take larger European trains, and the stations along the route were all built with very tasteful architecture, but crucially with the platforms between the tracks, so more could be added if necessary. It had wide curves and small gradients, and only one level crossing to allow faster trains. Although the Great Central never reached its continental goal, in an age where we do now have a channel tunnel, it does seem quite appealing. I have some letters that were written by villagers objecting to the closure of the line. British Railways' argument was simply that the line was not profitable and had to be closed. They offered surveys of passenger numbers, but said interestingly that the information they provided was not to be discussed, which I think shows that they were intent on closing the railway no matter what objection they face. And they offered a bus service to replace the trains. I understand that people from this village did use the railway, to the extent even of getting the train home for their lunch hour, but there was never anyone at the station to take their money, so naturally it was an unprofitable line. The first time I read these letters it brought a tear to my eye, because their arguments are just so strong. This lady wrote to the MP that there is no doctor's surgery, no dentist or opticians nearer than the closest town. There are hardly any shopping facilities in the village, and young people rely on the railway for travel, for work or study. The vicar objected to the bus route that was proposed because he said that he didn't trust the company to serve our village, which was very perceptive because I used to get that bus to school, but my mum used to have to drive me two villages over to the nearest bus stop.
The villagers made an alternative suggestion. They wanted a road-to-rail bus service that would connect seven of the surrounding villages to the station every two hours, which seems like quite a good idea. But they weren't the only people who wanted the line to stay open. The Great Central Association formed to argue that the line had opened as part of a new route to the Channel Tunnel, big enough to take standard European freight wagons and passenger coaches. There is still no other railway north of London that can take this traffic essential for British exporters without very costly alterations. The only structural work required on the Great Central is the setting back of the passenger platform edges by only four inches. The Channel Tunnel is now to be built, but the essential railway required to feed traffic to and from it is to be finally closed. They rejected the idea that it was unprofitable, saying that statistics still showed it to be more profitable per tonne of freight or passenger carried than any other main line. So they say the government should redevelop this railway for express freight services, including European-sized trains to and from the Dover train ferry and subsequently the Channel Tunnel. They want local freight delivery and collection by light diesel locomotives and for local and stopping passenger services which can cover their costs provided the overheads of fixed equipment are covered by freight and express passenger services. And they say that if British railways are unable or still unwilling to do this then there is no commercial reason why private enterprise should not do so providing that it is allowed full commercial freedom. The Great Central ran alongside the M1 for a stretch, and that's still quite busy, which proves that there is demand for transport along this route. They had already agreed to build the Channel Tunnel. We so nearly had an integrated, efficient, environmentally friendly way of moving freight and people from Europe, but the government dismantled the infrastructure for it. To emphasise, when this village was served by the railway, it was a traditional rural community, so people didn't really need to leave. It had farms and workshops that produced stockings where people could work, and it had shops and a post office and its own policeman, and there was a butcher and a tailor and a carpenter, and allotments where people would grow their own food. But in the decades following the Second World War, when townies started moving into the village, they did have to travel. They had to travel for work, they had to travel to the shops, they had to travel to see their friends. So at that point, travel becomes integral to living in the countryside. But that's also the very moment that the railways were dismantled. And they're still making this mistake today, with all these new housing estates on the edge of villages that are 10 minutes from anywhere. The car is unavoidable. And our population has grown by 20 million since the 60s. We have more people, but less trains. But as you see, the track bed is still here. Could they not just rebuild it? A private company made a concerted effort to do so. The Central Railway Company wanted to reopen this line for freight, which would take lorries on trains straight from the Channel Tunnel to distribution centres around the country. This would take lorries off the road and ease congestion, which would benefit motorists, who are apparently the object of the government's fantasies and their continuing distrust of trains. But the government rejected this idea in 1996 and again in 2003, because it would cost £8 billion, even though it was a private sector project. So to emphasise, a private company, the Great Central Railway, built a fantastic piece of national infrastructure. The government then dismantled it and refused to let private companies preserve it. And then when a private company offered to rebuild it, the government said no twice. But then the government decided that they actually did want a railway after all, just not one that used all of the redundant land waiting for track to be relayed. No, they wanted a different railway called HS2. The idea behind HS2 was to connect the south to the north so the poor northerners could commute to London and the government wouldn't have to worry about creating work for them where they lived. But being as it was a project to help the north, they started building it in London and then ran out of money, so now it's only going to go to Birmingham. But before the government ran out of money, they forced all of the people living along the now councilled northern leg of the route to sell their houses and farms at the cost of about £600 million. And for what? Like, this has ruined people's lives. If their houses and farms haven't been completely destroyed, they've been living in a state of chronic insecurity for over a decade. This is not what the government is supposed to do. The government is now trying to get rid of this land so future administrations couldn't finish this railway even if they wanted to. And just to really top it all off, parts of the Great Central are being rebuilt by railway preservationists. I'm sure a company would love to send lorries up and down here if only the government would let them. There are counter-arguments to a lot of the things I've said here, but I think most of them are the product of silly decisions people have made that have left us in a situation with no easy answer. The stuff has been built on parts of the old Great Central's route, but that shouldn't have been allowed to happen.
And people don't argue that we should get rid of the railways that we still have. I think if the Great Central was still here, it would see a lot of use. All of this just feels so quintessentially British, because what we have here is so nearly fantastic, but because of a handful of silly decisions made by people in power, it's not very good at all. If this line still existed, it's conceivable that I might be able to drive my car onto a train in my village and go anywhere in Europe. But as it stands, I can't even go to the shop.